why we're here. We want to stay committed, connected to people in our community. We want to continue to engage your interest in our ongoing research because finding an effective cure for Alzheimer's or any kind of chronic disease requires the input of people from all walks of life. Today, we want you to know that you are valued, you are heard, and most importantly, your contributions are always respected. We have five different presenters for you today. Uh, the first is Dr. James Law, who directs our clinical cognitive neurology here at Emory. He also conducts the largest, the Emory Healthy Brain Study, which is the largest clinical research study that's here in Atlanta. Uh, he is also vice chair of the Department of Neurology here at Emory. Our second presenter is Dr. Aaron Anderson, who is a neurologist uh, working between Grady, University, Grady Hospital and Emory University Hospital. He's a proud graduate of Xavier University in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, where he got his undergraduate degree. Our third presenter is going to be Dr. James Bennett, well known to a well known neurologist uh, to many of us here who helps with the clinical education and training of urologists. But he also runs a number of clinical research studies, both in prostate cancer and urologic health. He conducts something every second Saturday in September, the Champs um, Men's Health Summit, where Men are given an opportunity to get free screening for overall health issues. Certainly we participate doing memory screens, but you can get other resources, social resources and connections. Uh, Dr. Bennett um, is extremely well respected and is an active clinical researcher as well. Our fourth presenter is Dr. Derek Griffith, who leads the Center for Men's Health at Vanderbilt University. He uh, does a lot of research on social behavioral, um, um, the social and behavioral aspects of health equity and health access. And our final presenter is Dr. Joe Nacera, who is a phys exercise physiologist who's going to give us some hopeful information about how we can manage exercise and why that's important. So um, at this time, if you can kind of make sure that you keep your screen clear and minimize any of the distractions, none of you who are participating are necessarily visible to us. We know that you're there. Right now we have about 172 people who are currently um, um, on web or on the Zoom webinar. And um, we can't see you, but we know that you're there. So if you have questions and answers, you uh, down at the bottom, you can put them in our chat or answer them, put them in the question and answer section. Ms. Cornelia Dorbin, who is the director, uh, project director for our outreach here, is going to facilitate the discussions and we'll all chip in and answer the questions. At this time, Jim. Um. Thank you, Dr. Parker, and, um, and thank you everybody who has um, joined um, this webinar. Um, uh, it's a special webinar. It's, it's always a little disconcerting for me um, to, uh, to be talking, um, really talking to myself. And, uh, and I've elected today, for those of you who've seen me before, I've elected today um, not to, uh, to use slides and um, I'm going to uh, be discussing the, uh, the topic of brain health and from a very uh, different approach than I have um, ever in the past. And, um, um, and I wanna start by um, sharing a story um, that um, happened uh, many years ago when I was in college um, at Duke University. I had been out uh, one weekend um, doing some things. I don't even remember where I had been, but I realized um, driving home that I was way, way too drunk to be driving. So I pulled off the side of the road and, uh, and promptly passed out in my car. Uh, eventually, police officers came and woke me up. Um, the officers uh, talked to me. Um, they eventually drove me home, uh, left me a card uh, with the location of my vehicle, um, and uh, left that with me in my apartment so I could retrieve the car uh, the next day. Um, 
last Friday, as everybody knows, um, in Atlanta, <clears throat> Mr. Brooks um, fell asleep in a drive through line at a Wendy's. Um, and at the end of his interactions with the police officers, he had been shot twice in the back and killed. This weekend, I will enjoy Father's Day with my daughter. <clears throat> Mr. Brooks will not have that opportunity. That um, parallel between what happened to me and what happened to Mr. Brooks brought to me uh, a clarity that I've never uh, previously had um, for understanding what is my privilege, not my white privilege, uh, but my privilege for not being a black man. Um, every minority, uh, racial, ethnic, uh, religious uh, minority group in this country has faced prejudice uh, and bigotry um, to some level. Um, but perhaps with the exception of Native Americans, no other group uh, has been victimized or subjected to the systemic and institutional uh, violence that has been um, um, brought upon Black men and women. And to my shame, um, it took the trauma of witnessing the brutal murder of George Floyd um, to shake me out of my um, complacency, um, to make me realize that it's not good enough for us individually to do what we can to improve ourselves. Uh, but we should have been for many years doing more to ensure that something like that could never happen. So we march and we protest we spark discussions among our social groups, we like, write letters, and we vote. And we wonder if this time the change will be lasting, and I truly believe that it will be, um, for many reasons. I think that recent events have sparked a burning anger and outrage at that disingenuous and very unnaturally skin-colored man that occupies the White House who seems to lack any uh, human empathy. Um, I think that um, we all are experiencing a collective post-traumatic stress uh, that's manifest. Um, when I feel anxious driving past a black man walking down the street and I wanna yell at him to be careful, when we wake uh, uh, with disturbed thoughts at four o'clock, uh, one of the first thoughts that goes through is um, the unforgettable recollection of Mr. Floyd uh, yelling for his mama uh, moments before he died. So these are, are things that have been um, racking our country uh, and each one of us um, to our core. And, um, and I believe um, that they will produce a lasting change. And when we began discussing how to approach this, how to address this, what's happening um, as a, a center, as a brain health center, as an Alzheimer's center, um, part of me questioned, um, you know, how do we presume to take on such a role? What, what place can we claim that allows us to speak to this issue that's so important? Um, isn't this topic out of scope? Um, for the Alzheimer's Center and for the Brain Health Center. Our mission, after all, is to better understand disease and to promote um, uh, brain health for everybody. And as I thought about it, I realized that there are um, really very uh, important connections. Um, before the, uh, the racial unrest uh, and the demands for uh, change and justice, we all recognized that uh, COVID-19 um, which has now killed over 115,000 Americans, was disproportionately killing black men and women. And why that has been happening is not a mystery. 
it's a uh, it's a historical understanding of uh, generations of slavery and Jim Crow and segregation and prejudice that denied access to proper education for black children. Uh, that in turn led to the lack of um, black adults um, who had the training to become health professionals, doctors and nurses and healthcare providers who could deliver care to their communities. The segregation, um, those of us in Atlanta know um, that up through the 60s, uh, we had the Grady's uh, because um, uh, public policy, government policy um, dictated that there be a separation in the care that was received by black people and white people uh, and, uh, and uh, providing poorer care um, to some people than to others. Uh, we know that the crimes of Tuskegee and others uh, that have so um, horrified um, uh, uh, all of us um, has led to a very um, rational uh, suspicion of medical research, uh, most of all among black men. That in turn has led to a lack of understanding because without the research in particular groups, we lack understanding about diseases in certain groups. And ultimately those aspects together have led to the current circumstances um, that caused uh, black people to die at a disproportionate rate from COVID-19 and from a host of other medical conditions. And as I thought about that, um, uh, there is no difference um, between uh, the disparities that we see in the illness and deaths occurring uh, because of COVID-19 um, to our situation currently with Alzheimer's disease and other diseases that cause dementia. We know, for instance, uh, that um, African Americans are nearly twice as likely as Caucasian Americans to suffer from dementing illnesses. We know this. Um, we also know um, that the, uh, the burdens um, uh, are greater on African Americans. Uh, we know that the lack of access to quality care as well as to educational um, opportunities about these conditions has led to a delay in diagnosis so that on average, uh, African Americans are diagnosed with Alzheimer's and other uh, illnesses several years, four or more years later on average than the white patient is. Um, the, uh, the, um, the difficult in engaging African Americans in research participation has led to differences in our understanding of Alzheimer's disease and related illnesses um, between um, uh, uh, different groups. Um, I have um, um, commented frequently uh, about um, uh, a very important study, something called the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, which was launched in 2003. And in the course of that study, um, we learned things about um, brain imaging, about spinal fluid proteins that allow us to diagnose the presence of Alzheimer's disease in living people often uh, we can make that diagnosis in the very earliest stages of disease, and we can even identify the disease before there are even any symptoms. The problem um, with these studies, um, which provide such accurate diagnosis for these conditions, is that they don't apply to everyone equally. Because of the incredibly small number of non-Caucasian uh, participants in that study, the results are entirely applicable to white people um, but they may not be uh, to uh, um, non-Caucasian uh, populations. And in fact, several recent publications have indicated that the levels of spinal fluid proteins, the Alzheimer's-related proteins, as well as the appearance of imaging on special scans that detect Alzheimer's pathology is in fact distinct and different between whites and blacks. And in fact, in fact if we're gonna apply those tools, correctly, we need to set different thresholds for different groups of individuals. But we don't have the data to do that. And so um, some could rightly ask, um, well, you know, what's the big deal? So what if we can't diagnose? So what if there's a delay in diagnosis and recognition of Alzheimer's disease and other conditions uh, among African Americans and white folks? Um, and um, there is an important impact now. Um, there is a, uh, a personal and financial impact. 
um, when there is a lack of understanding, a delay in diagnosis, a lack of access to services uh, that should be available to patients and their families, there's a greater burden on individual caregivers and families who assume the responsibility for caring for their loved one, uh, often at, uh, after sacrificing uh, jobs and their personal lives. Um, and there is a much greater frequency of uh, patients who are not recognized, whose families haven't been educated, uh, coming to a crisis point um, so that, um, that the, the care of that individual is managed in an emergency room or through 911 or through ambulance services rather than being managed proactively in a constructive way. Those are things that are happening right now because of the differences in recognition and how we approach um, patients. And there is a greater looming disparity that's gonna be much, much worse. Um, right now, um, this year, towards the latter half of 2020, we expect Biogen, uh, one of the big drug companies, to take um, their drug, uh, a drug called aducanumab, to the FDA for approval for clinical use. If successful, that will be the first drug um, that will have uh, demonstrated and been approved for clinical use as a means of slowing the progression of Alzheimer's disease. The drugs that we currently have are woefully inadequate. What we need are drugs that will slow the progression of disease so that hopefully people can avoid uh, the ravages of late stage disease. And aducanumab is one of those drugs that I have pointed to in previous talks as really an important ray of hope in what has otherwise been a list of dismal failures. But here's the catch. That drug um, is only going to be useful and will only be approved for use in patients who are identified at the very earliest stages of disease. So if black folks are recognized and diagnosed on average four years later than white folks, who do you think is going to get the advantage of those drugs that are going to have meaningful impact uh, on, on slowing the, uh, the progression and delaying the course of Alzheimer's disease. And it's even worse as we look farther forward if we don't address some of these disparities right now. One of the biggest uh, points of emphasis in, the, in our Alzheimer's Center and the Healthy Brain Study is to try and identify tools to predict who's gonna get sick before they get sick. We can detect the presence of pathology uh, in healthy people but we don't have a way of predicting um, which of those people are gonna get sick. So one of the uh, primary focuses of our work in the Alzheimer's Center and in the Emory Healthy Brain Study has been to try and develop these predictive tools. But if we develop those tools based on studies engaging almost exclusively uh, Caucasians, um, guess who those tests will accurately predict and protect? Um, when we can apply uh, drugs and treatments to prevent development of disease, um, those treatments uh, will be reliably used in those people in whom we can accurately predict the course of the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, uh, in order to know what treatments are necessary and appropriate. So this is, um, it's a, you know, I, um, I usually um, like to, uh, to um, have a little fun when I give talks, uh, make some jokes, um, uh, engage people in a very positive way. Um, uh, this is a very different experience for me, um, not being able to see my audience, um, but also um, wanting to, uh, to share some things that were, um, have been weighing very heavily. Um, but I, I can tell you that we're continuing to, uh, to try and address some of these problems. Um, a major focus for our center has been to address some of the disparities um, in our research activities. Um, and, um, and this um, series of webinars came out of a discussion that we were having um, about how we could better engage black men because among um, African Americans, we've had actually quite good success um, engaging black women uh, because you guys all know in general, um, women are just better than men, and so they participate and they help. Um, but we have ha had terrible, terrible um, failures in, act, uh, in effectively engaging black men. And so um, we had a conversation about what things um, we could do that would uh, more effectively engage black men. 
And that was coming, that meeting happened shortly after Mr. Floyd's murder. And um, uh, Dr. Clint Dye, who is part of our um, leadership group um, uh, planning this initiative, um, expressed his frustration and his um, uh, belief that, um, uh, that trying to engage black men right now without addressing uh, what is a much more acute and emotional and um, uh, important uh, issue for them um, was just stupid and uh, was not going to be effective. And so um, we ha we decided to put together this series to uh, to address the uh, the desires and um, and preferences of Black men. We will continue to do so. We will continue to listen and engage, um, try and and to, uh, to deliver what you want, what black men want in particular, what black men and women want. Um, we, we want to be engaged for the long term in order to sufficiently earn your trust. Um, we don't expect you to give it to us. We don't wanna just show up and ask for things, ask for you to sign up for stuff, ask for you to give me your blood or spinal fluid and then be on my merry way. It's all for your good, right? No, that's not how it works. Um, we want partners in this endeavor, and we need partners in this endeavor. Um, we need you to engage with us. Um, we want you to trust us, and we will do everything that we can to move forward um, what we think is a, a critically important element of addressing disparities so that they don't broaden and worsen um, uh, in our area of work and uh, in healthcare in general. Um, so um, I apologize that um, uh, um, some of my um, presentation was a bit heavy. Um, uh, I think right now it's hard to avoid that, um, but I want you to know that um, you know we'll go back to uh, to being a little bit more normal, um, hopefully um, face to face, and and um, and and keep moving these things forward. Um, keep in, in mind to our calls to action. Um, but yet um, uh, try and get past some of the rawness of the, uh, the difficulty and the emotion uh, that we're all experiencing right now. And we look forward to working with each and every one of you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Law. Um, so next up, so again, we will continue on with our program. We will be hearing from Dr. Aaron Anderson. He's going to be addressing heart health today. And if you have uh, questions, you can post them in the chat. So uh, Dr. Anderson, I am going to pull up your slides. Give me just one moment. And if you want to um, introduce your topic while I Yes. I can go ahead. Um, yes, again, my name is Aaron Anderson. Um, I'm one of the vascular neurologists uh, here at uh, Emory University and at Grady Hospital Systems. Um, and I uh, just wanted to give a brief uh, talk and introduction about stroke and kind of what a, as a vascular neurologist, what are the main large salient points I would want you to know um, one for yourself, but also for others, should you uh, ever uh, be with somebody who has a stroke or somebody uh, who is at risk for stroke so we can help prevent a uh, stroke before it happens. That's the best way to treat stroke is before it happens. Um, so what is a stroke? It is a sudden onset of focal neurologic deficits. It is uh, focal neurologic deficit is where one side of the body doesn't work or speech, um, vision, uh, balance, uh, understanding. There's a lot of different symptoms that come with a uh, stroke. Um, what we'll be looking at is that it is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. Um, and it is a leading cause of severe adult disability. With stroke, what happens is somebody with a major devastating stroke, the care that the patient needs is too great that they end up not going back home, but needing the services of a long-term care facility, nursing home, or um, hopefully a short-term rehab stay. But that also takes us away from our social network, our support system, our loved ones uh, during that time period. 
So our goal is one to prevent the deficits from stroke, but also prevent stroke uh, altogether. There are two types of strokes. There are ischemic stroke as well as hemorrhagic stroke. With ischemic stroke, that's caused due to a blood clot that is blocking the blood flow to one specific portion of the brain. Uh, with that blood clot there, it leads to deficits um, that are gonna be on the opposite side of the body. So having a blood clot is one type of stroke, and this is the majority, 80% of strokes are ischemic. There are also hemorrhagic strokes. Hemorrhagic strokes are strokes that are caused due to um, the blood vessel ruptures. It can be due to an aneurysm, trauma, uh, high blood pressure is, is the number one uh, cause for these ruptures of the blood vessels. And that can cause deficits of stroke just as severe, if not more severe, than our ischemic strokes of the blood clot. When symptoms of a stroke start, we don't know which type of stroke our patient is having. So what we need folks to do is call 911, act fast, get to the nearest stroke ready hospital so that we can then appropriately and aggressively treat stroke as best as possible. With the act fast, uh, uh, it's a nationwide program to get what stroke symptoms are, and act fast is face, arm, speech, and time. Again, we want you to call 911. Taking an aspirin is if we think we're having a heart attack, we take an aspirin. If we're thinking we're having a stroke, we don't know which type. We do not want you to take an aspirin because one in five people having a stroke or having a bleeding type stroke, and the aspirin could make that stroke worse. Again, face, arm, speech, and time, any of these deficits on one side of the body, whether it's numbness, weakness with speech, if it's trouble getting your language out, this is one of the pictures that we show stroke patients when they come to the emergency room to encourage them to describe the picture to us. And there's a lot of things happening in this picture, but there is one stroke syndrome that if patients have, they can describe everything on the right half of the picture, washing dishes, the sink overflowing, but they will ignore this, the kid that is about to need a neurosurgical consult for falling off a three-legged stool. That is called a left-sided neglect. It is still a severe stroke, despite language being completely intact. Missing the left half of our world would mean if we happen to find our car, we would miss or not realize that oncoming traffic is just to the left of us, and then we are putting ourselves and others at risk. So these are some symptoms of a major stroke, but again, the most common ones that we want everybody to know are the face, facial weakness one side of the body or the other, arm weakness on one side or the other, or numbness, speech difficulties, slurred speech, or trouble getting the words out, um, and then time. We want to know what time it started. We have three hours to treat for TPA. Um, we have advanced treatment, which is called a thrombectomy, where we physically go in and remove the clot to prevent that continued damage from the stroke. Um, only not a lot of people qualify for that simply because that large of a clot is not um, it is very common, but to get to the hospital in time in order to retrieve or uh, to have that procedure is also why it's so important to act fast and call 911. Preventing a stroke, modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors. Again, modifiable risk factors, high blood pressure is risk factors number one, two, and three. If we treat and control blood pressure, our rate of strokes go down by about 60%. Um, Controlling the other risk factors, such as heart disease, diabetes, high cholesterol, all those help to add that method of stroke prevention. Quitting smoking, heavy alcohol use is also a risk factor for stroke. Physical inactivity, and uh, we'll have a discussion on that uh, later as well. Um, diet, obesity, all these are risk factors for stroke that are modifiable, we can change. Non-modifiable risk factors are things that we can lie about, but we can't change. Age is one of those. As we age, the rate of stroke increases. I want you to keep this image in your mind that the rate of stroke after the age of 65, 75, the rate of stroke is higher. We're almost 10, almost 
12% of our population has that increased rate of stroke. One of the other non modifiable risk factors are race. And when you look at this graph, this graph is this zero line would be as if every ethnic group in the United States had the same rate of stroke as our white counterparts. However, every um, minority ethnic group in the US has a higher rate of stroke, but you can see it's heavily tilted towards African Americans having a much higher rate of stroke compared to our white counterparts. The scary part about this graph is that the ages 35 to 55, the rate of death from stroke is almost four times higher compared to our white counterparts. This is not only due to the increased number of strokes, but also the increased severity of strokes that occur in our young African Americans. A lot of this can be uh, rectified by controlling blood pressure, one getting diagnosed, getting on medications that help, and then helping to maintain um, uh, control of our blood pressure. I just saw a quick question about what uh, TPA. TPA is a clot busting medicine. It's a uh, medicine that's given in uh, the stroke ready hospitals. It's given through an IV and we can only give it again once we know what type of stroke um, the patient is having. Uh, and we can only have, uh, we only have three hours to give. Other non-modifiable risk factors for stroke are going to be genetics, family history. Now, having a family history of stroke does not necessarily mean we are destined to have a stroke ourselves. Uh, we can do things to help modify, again, lower our risk for stroke. Um, and then here, the geographic region. The Southeast United States is part of what is known as the stroke belt. And if you look at this map, Georgia and portions of the coastal Carolinas as well as Georgia have uh, a very much higher rate of stroke death compared to other parts of the country. So our stroke belt that we live in is why this is kind of showing that increased rate of strokes here in the Southeast. Um, our goal is that we can try to reverse this map as best as possible by increasing the awareness and helping to control our risk factors for stroke. How can you help? Again, it's understanding that act fast. Calling 911, knowing the risk and the, uh, what the warning signs of stroke are can help save your life. And if you share what you've learned about stroke risk factors as well as uh, warning signs for stroke, that is something that can have uh, a definitely positive effect in helping uh, maybe save your life should your friend or your loved one or somebody recognize stroke symptoms in you. Uh, we can and must do better to make a difference with increasing stroke awareness and contacting just the local stroke center for additional information as, to, as uh, in addition to additional ways of volunteering uh, to increase the stroke awareness. So TPA is that three hour time window is really just so there's not an increased rate of bleeding. Uh, as stroke is there, it causes damage. We describe it a lot like a forest fire forest fire, you don't send the firefighters in to save the part of the forest that's already burnt. You send them in to save the rest of the forest. TPA, if you give it with already a large area deficit, uh, that deficit of that part of the brain that's already damaged has an increased rate of bleeding. So TPA is safe within that first three, some patients within four and a half hours, but we really want to try to not use it beyond that because of that increased risk of bleeding with that medicine. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Uh, one more question. Um, we often hear, take a baby aspirin. Should we take an, a baby aspirin or not? So at the first sign of stroke, so what I was saying, if you have a stroke, if you think you're having a stroke, I want you to call 911 and get to the hospital. Um, as far as being on a daily aspirin, those are things for primary prevention. If you have history of heart disease, if you have uh, kidney disease, uh, high blood pressure. For some of our patients, being on an aspirin can you know, serve as a prevention for heart disease and stroke. Um, but what I was specifically speaking of was if we think we're having an active stroke, 
we would not want to add an aspirin because of that increased risk of or 20 percent of people have a bleeding stroke and aspirin could potentially worsen that Okay, so let's keep moving. Uh, next up, we have Dr. James Bennett. He's going to be talking about prostate health. Dr. Bennett? Well, Dr. Parker, thanks again for inviting me to participate in this conference. Uh, uh, you always do a wonderful job of bringing the community up to date with new and exciting changes in medicine. Uh, I don't know how to change the slides. So, uh, okay, I can, I can advance them for you. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today is prostate cancer, and I too am very unusual not seeing, it's very unusual for me not seeing the audience. I, I like a lot of audience participation. But let me just give you a brief overview about prostate cancer in men's health. Uh, and the issues with prostate cancer really are reflected in, 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 in taking care of men because men are very reluctant to, uh, to go to a doctor. As a matter of fact, most of us wait until the last moment uh, about 18% of us wait until we're at death door before we go in. Unlike women, most of those, most women go in at the first sign of any illness. This is devastating, particularly on a disease like prostate cancer. And as you can see, uh, one in nine men at some point will probably be diagnosed with prostate cancer. And the, the, the incidence, uh, at least the, uh, the number of men that are, are uh, uh, diagnosed can exceed uh, uh, more than 160,000 people. Roughly 30,000 men will die, and unfortunately, a vast majority of these men are African American, and it's all of the risk factors that everyone uh, already knows about, the high blood pressure, the hypertension, the failure for, uh, for men to go in to, to seek medical advice before symptoms show up. Next slide. Now, we're going to just briefly go over uh, some of the newer things in diagnosis of prostate cancer. If you remember from, the, from my initial slide, it says, what's new down there? Uh, this really is a takeoff on a uh, play that Kenny Leon and I did together. And the, and the name of the play is, is what's, what's up down there. And it really addresses the whole um, um, mentality of men and, and the reluctance of men to, to seek medical care. Uh, and it really goes back to when men and women are born and it goes through their life and it really shows how men, uh, their path to health is totally different from women. And we think about everything else before we think about our health. In terms of the diagnosis of prostate cancer, uh, everyone knows about the digital rectal exam and the PSA. A few words about the PSA. There is no normal PSA, and I don't care what any physician or anyone tells you, the PSA is a very nonspecific uh, test. However, it's the best test we have. It is important that not only the patient understand its use, but it's all equally important that the physicians also understand its use and accept the fact that there is no normal PSA. We're not gonna get into the guidelines and the controversy about who should be screened and who should not be screened. But the rough rule of thumbs that I will give to the audience is this, is that yes, the lab reports a PSA of normal has been anything less than four. But we know that in certain risk groups, particularly men of African descent, doesn't matter whether you're from the US or whether you uh, came, fell off the boat in Jamaica, it doesn't really matter. If you're of African descent, you are at high risk for prostate cancer. We don't understand all of the reasons why, but that is an absolute fact. And so for those men who are of African descent or any ethnic group with a significant family history of prostate cancer, you really should strongly consider having a, a digital rectal exam starting at the age of 40. And depending upon your family history, you may want to consider having a PSA if your PSA uh, comes back, say, 2 or greater than 2.5, you may want to have a, 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 a detailed discussion with the urologist because there was a study reported probably 10 years ago that says that if a man has a life expectancy of greater than 10 years, that maybe waiting to a PSA exceeds 4, you're going to miss about 25% of cancers, and some of those cancers, by the time they are diagnosed, will already be advanced. And so that is why, again, you need to know your numbers. 
The other important number other than the 2.5 as a cutoff is what we call the PSA velocity. And what is a PSA velocity? That's the rate of change of a PSA from one year to the next. For an example, uh, I just stated what I use as a cutoff for a PSA, but let's say your PSA is one, and then the very next year your PSA goes up to 1.5, 1.75, and you're gonna say, well, Dr. Bennett said that's fine. Well, no, that's not quite the whole story. If your PSA changes more than 0 0.35, 0.35 per year, that means that is a concern that something else is going on within your prostate gland that may not be explained by benign enlargement of your prostate. That, those are the two benchmarks, if you will, that I would certainly uh, probably request a, a discussion with the urologist and then to make a decision about the indication to go ahead with a biopsy. The transrectal ultrasound and biopsy would be the next step, and that's simply taking an ultrasound probe and taking samples of the prostate and, re and sending those, um, those uh, samples to the laboratory for the lab to evaluate whether there is cancer. I think the next three uh, bullet points are some of the more exciting uh, things that have come down the pike. Consider the PCA3 and the 4K scores as, a, as, as other surrogates to use to help uh, augment the information you get from a PSA. These tests uh, gives the provider the information regarding the probability on a subsequent biopsy that they're gonna find cancer. So the test, if it's positive, does not mean you're gonna have prostate cancer. It just incre it increases the probability of you having prostate cancer, depending upon what the, how high the PCA3 score is or how high the 4K score is. So those are other surrogates that can be done in addition to the PSA uh, that will help provide additional information. The other exciting tool that has come down the pike is the use of the MRI. Yes, it's a very expensive tool, but what we now know is that many, that many prostate cancers, particularly the more aggressive prostate cancer, are, 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 can be picked up probably much easier on an MRI than your conventional biopsy. Why is that? Well, it's especially important in African Americans because 70% of Caucasian urology, I mean, Caucasian uh, prostate cancer occur in the peripheral zone, meaning that part of the prostate that you can feel on the digital rectal exam. However, in African American men, about 25% of their cancers are anterior, and those cancers within the prostate can easily be missed upon a routine uh, prostate exam. So by having an MRI, you know where those areas are because of the, what we call the abnormal T2 signals. And so you want to make sure you target those either by fusion biopsies or by what we call a cognitive approach where these lesions are located within the prostate and we take saturated uh, samples from these areas to send to the pathologist to look for prostate cancer. If you don't have the ability to do three-dimensional ultrasounds, then what uh, would be helpful in terms of the information you uh, that is obtained from the radiologist is if these tumors are uh, anterior, exactly where anteriorly they are, and then the urologist just has to further ins insert the needle through the peripheral zone in order to access the anterior portions of the prostate. Next slide. Now, once a diagnosis of prostate cancer is made, the other information that you may want to have as a patient with your urologist is, is about having the lab do what we call a Polaris test. And what the Polaris does, it actually looks at uh, different forms of genetic material within the cancers of, uh, uh, of, the, of the prostate. And so what we do know from, from uh, a variety of prostate cancers is that not all Gleason 6 cancers, not all Gleason 7 cancers are the same. The bowel behavior of those cancers can vary, even with the same PSA level, even with the same Gleason score. So what the Polaris test is able to do is looking at other types of genetic material on that biopsy to say to a patient, you are at, if your risk is low at 2%, that says that you may be a good candidate for watch for waiting. I admit as a urologist and not just urologist, radiation oncologist, we overtreat prostate cancer. And so what this test will allow you to do is to make an informed decision as to whether the best course of action for you is watch for waiting or whether you want to 
uh, go through more uh, uh, invasive or more aggressive type treatment of your prostate cancer. So keep, uh, keep the Polaris test in mind uh, if you ever get the diagnosis of prostate cancer and make sure you may want to engage your urologist with this discussion. Next slide. Now, in terms of treatment, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, and that is localized prostate cancer, there is no right or wrong answer. Any physician who tells you that this is the best proven treatment for prostate cancer is blowing smoke up your rear end. That is not, there's never been a randomized study in the history of urology that has proven that one treatment is better than the other. So what you really have to do and should do is basically look at all of your options. What I tell all of my patients is that I'm not God. I can't tell you what the right or wrong answer is. What you, your wife, and family should do is to go through the pros and cons of each treatment, look where you are in life, and then make an informed decision. I mean, in other words, if you're an 80-year-old man and you're healthy and you're jogging every day, I'm not quite certain you should have a radical prostatectomy because you're going to have a higher incidence of urinary incontinence and a higher incidence of erectile dysfunction, which certainly is going to affect your quality of life. I'm one of the uh, unusual urologists in that, to me, survival is very important, but quality of life is equally important. So make sure you do not belittle the importance of the quality of life as you're making this decision. Next slide. Next, okay. Now, we talk a lot about nutrition. And I think what you're going to find from this slide, and I'm going to point out one important thing before we leave this slide, is that there are very important ways to, to not only prevent prostate cancer, but make your survival better if you are diagnosed with prostate cancer. Now, prevention, we really have to be more aggressive in our younger years. And what do I mean by that? We know that men that are in their late teens and early 20s, one in one in three of those men already have cancerous changes in the prostate. Not prostate cancer, but cancerous changes. Something happens about 15 to 20 years later where those, a certain segment of patients, African Americans and, and men with a family history, undergo uh, changes within their prostate consistent with invasive prostate cancer. Why is that? Well, there's a whole host of reasons. Diets high in animal fat, uh, uh, low vitamin D, all of the things you see here. But the one thing that stands out here and is, 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 is perfectly, uh, perfectly timed in view of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is vitamin D deficiency. You see, more than 70% of African Americans are deficient in vitamin D. This applies to prostate cancer. More than 70% of my men with prostate cancer are deficient in vitamin D. But here's the interesting thing about it, is that the lower your vitamin D, the more aggressive these cancers are. And so it is very important that we as a, as a healthcare community be more cognizant of the role of vitamin D. Ironically, it's the same deficiency we are seeing in the death rate in African Americans who are dying of COVID-19. So vitamin D is a very important vitamin that we have to address uh, the deficiencies in our populations. Next slide. These are the dietary uh, uh, foods that you should consider in terms of chemo prevention, meaning preventing prostate cancer before it starts. And the key thing with that is you've got to start your children very early before they start developing these cancerous changes within their prostate gland. And that means in the teens, uh, well, actually even before the teens, start them eating healthy, getting the animal fat out of their diet, getting a lot of the dairy out of their, out of, uh, out of their diet, and incorporating these things. And it's, the picture is pretty self-explanatory. You, you, if we eat more fruits and vegetables and stay away from the animal fat, make sure we are, uh, we, we're cognizant of our vitamin D level, I think we can not only address the issue of prostate cancer, but the issues of, that affect men's health universally. Uh, because all of the, the, the messages that I'm giving you regarding lowering your risk of prostate cancer will lower your risk of the things that will lead to, uh, to poor brain health, will lead to cardiovascular disease, will lead to diabetes, etc. So it is important that we eat healthy. Next slide. 
Well, to summarize, as a urologist, I have to give you this joke. This is a guy doing a routine rectal exam, and, he's, and we all, urologists always say, Mr., uh, please relax. And you can see he got his, 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 his graduation ring caught up in there. So with that being said, I'm going to end this presentation, and, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Okay, wow. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bennett. Um, and we want to be very mindful of the time. I think we have like eight questions. We'll try to get to uh, all of them, but we may hold them to the end but I, so we can get to our next two presenters. But uh, very quickly, um, mm -hmm. is there a genetic marker for... Well, they're coming up, there is no genetic markers per se, but there are newer and newer markers that are coming up that, that we are now starting to understand, like things like BRCA1 and BRCA2 that we now are identifying in some of these hereditary prostate cancer. The reason that's significant is I think in the next five to 10 years, we're going to find, and some of the preliminary data already suggests that if someone has, say, BRCA2 uh, uh, mutation abnormality, that maybe some of those patients don't, will respond to one form of therapy versus another form of therapy. And that's where I see the role of these different hereditary and genetic markers going to play a very important part in selecting what is the most appropriate therapy based upon their genetic makeup. Okay, and the questions are still rolling in, but if you guys will be patient with us. Um, so, uh, someone just had prostate surgery. Uh, what is the best method to treat urine leakage? Uh, well, that's a long story, but the okay. first thing I'm going to say is if the, that patient, depending upon the type of incontinence he has, uh, is, is if it's urgent incontinence uh, and even mild stress, something that's, that we've used for years is Kegel exercises, and most women are familiar with that. That's a way of strengthening the pelvic floor. That would be the first line of therapy, and if that doesn't work, there are medical interventions, certain drugs. There are certain minimally invasive procedures that we can also do, but a lot of times those decisions are made after a patient has what we call a urodynamic study, which is like doing an EKG of the heart. This is an EKG of the bladder. It tells us all about the nerve functions of the bladder and the, and, and the control valve. Okay, and then we, we hear a lot about supplements. Um, you did say mm -hmm. we need more vitamin D, but um, so if someone is taking a, a vitamin D or E supplement, how much should they take? Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. Well, the first thing that should happen is a, a patient should get a, a level check, their vitamin D level check first to see where they are because not everyone is gonna have the same level. In other words, just think about having a, a, a you wanna keep your gas tank full. Well, the first thing you have to do is fill the gas tank up and then make sure you maintain that, that fullness. The same thing applies to vitamin D. Depending upon how severely you are deficient, uh, we like to fill the tank up. Normally that requires something like 50,000 international units a week. And once we get the tank full, the daily maintenance dose for most people is 4,000 international units per day. Okay, and uh, last question, and I don't know if you can see in the chat, but what about erectile d dysfunction after radiation and hormone therapy? Well, that's another tough question because see, I've never, known, I've never met a man yet who will admit that his, his, his penile size or his erections are the same. They always, doc, it's just not the same anymore. Well, after radiation and after any type of procedure regarding treating prostate cancer, you may have a significant uh, decrease in your erection. There are a lot of things you can do other than the classic pill. Uh, one of the best nutritional supplement is, is something that's called citrulline. And actually citrulline is, is a precursor to nitrous oxide. And that would help with brain health. It actually, uh, and that's something that if I'm a man, I would certainly use citrulline. It not only helps with uh, brain health because it depends on small vessel disease as well, uh, it, it helps with small vessel disease. It's the same small vessel disease that, that that's affect penile erection. So citrulline is usually very safe, uh, but it improves uh, uh, erectile function. It improves uh, your cognitive skills. Uh, and, it, and, and, and from some preliminary data, it does help him, uh, improve your brain health. But Monica, you would know that better than me. <laughs> 
All right. Okay. So what I, in closing with our prostate discussion, what's good for your brain, your heart is also good for your prostate. There you go. Right. <laughs> so we are switching gears. We are now going to uh, invite our next colleague, Dr. Derek Griffith to join us. He's going to be talking about um, our psychological health. And then we will close with Dr. Joe Nacera, who's going to talk about your physical health. So Dr. Griffith, Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm going to just jump right in in the interest of time. Um, let's see if I'm controlling this or you are. Oh, there we go. So we t I, I use this. This is actually a real ad from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, because often we think about men's health, this is where we start, is that the problem with men and men's health is the fact that men don't do what we're supposed to do. And while there's some element of truth to that, simplifying it simply to men's misbehavior is a problem. And we have to look at all the psychological, social, and even just the structural factors that contribute to that. You don't have the same kind of infrastructure in public health and medicine to treat non-urologic aspects of men's health that you do for women's health. You don't have degrees in, maternal, in men's health that you do like in maternal child health and public health. You don't have the same, you know, sort of understanding of the range of factors and how they intersect that we do in men's health, uh, for men's health that you do for women and children. And so, go back. Um, so it's important to understand men's health from a broader standpoint and not just sort of reduce it to penises and prostates or to sort of men's misbehavior. So from that standpoint, it's important to really think about men's health from a much more holistic standpoint. We know that a lot of the attitudes and beliefs that influence men's health are really important to understand how women in their lives um, influence the choices that men make, um, influence a lot of the motivations that men have, and that there are a lot of pragmatic reasons as to why men do things that decrease the priorities in terms of their health and increase the priority in terms of other things that make it seem like they're not caring about their health. Next slide. One of those things is simply how do men define what it means to be healthy? And so, yes, when you go to the doctor, a lot of times it's all those kinds of tests that you think about and see um, that are looking at, you know, biological factors, um, you know, things that you can tell through blood tests and, and you know, um, those kind of factors, different things that you test, you know, for um, diabetes, heart disease, and so forth that you will test in, in a doctor's office. But when you ask men about what, how they're feeling or what, how are you doing, how are you thinking about your health, a lot of times you get a more general question, uh, response like, I feel fine. Or you get a better sort of res response that really speaks to their overall sense of well-being. And you get a sense that actually speaks to, you know, how can they do the things that are important to them? So can they be intimate with their partner? Can they go to work? Can they function? Um, at home? Do they have enough energy to do the kinds of things that are important to them after they're uh, done with their busy day of work? So it's a very functional, pragmatic sort of way of understanding what it means to be healthy. The problem with these two definitions is that they don't speak to one another. And a lot of times doctors don't speak to the pragmatic side of how men are actually interpreting and defining what it means to be healthy. And there's this disconnect between the kinds of things that information you're getting when you go to the doctor's office and the kinds of ways that men are interpreting the information and the information they need about the practical implications of what they're doing. COVID has been no more of a, has been a, a particularly good example of how much our society devalues public health and values other aspects of our lives and health, particularly our economic health. And we see that in the lives of men too, that many people, not just men, are far more likely to um, take advantage of things that are going to promote their economic health, keep them going to work, much more than they are going to be worrying about whether or not they're physically healthy and so forth. And we have to think those priorities, take, take those priorities into account. Next slide. One of the things that I also wanted to just touch on was mental health. And we know that a lot that men are diagnosed with depression at about twice the rate of women. And there's always been a question of how is that possible, given that men have higher rates of suicide, higher rates of substance use, and other factors that tend to actually be associated with depression. This is a paper that we wrote some years ago that looked at a lot of the depressive symptoms and wanted to see if there are these patterns that hold when you actually increase, 
when you pay attention to symptoms that clinicians tend to acknowledge that are true of men when they actually have um, depression, that you tend to see more irritability, irritability, anger outbursts, aggression, substance use, and other kinds of risk taking when men are depressed. And so the presentation tends to be different and those aren't always captured in the traditional criteria or the traditional ways of thinking about what it means to be depressed, being sad and sullen and those kind of things. So what happens to the rates of depression when you actually take into account these factors? Next slide. Um, what happens is actually you see the difference between men and women actually go away. Go away. There is no two to one difference between men and women in the rates of depression when you actually see the fact that men, actually, when you take these kind of things into account, that clinicians, again, um, have talked about as factors that are relevant to men's health and the way that men tend to express depression and so forth. The important part of this is that you may see depression and what it looks like may look very different in men than, than what it looks like in women. And you have to take those kind of things into account. You can't just dismiss them as men not wanting to do something and so forth. There actually may be a legitimate reason or we're just missing and misdiagnosing what is actually happening with those particular men. Next slide. The last thing I wanted to talk about um, briefly was um, when we think about a lot of the, the things that we have talked about thus far, and you know, you have this sort of normal conversation about men not liking to go to the doctor and so forth. Um, there's actually not consistent data that actually supports this idea that men don't go to the doctor at the same rate of women. When we've done meta, meta, um, meta reviews and systematic reviews, we've actually found that there's more nuance to that conversation than what we typically have as a stereotype. Meaning that the, the difference between men and women is primarily in the rate of preventive screening and preventive treatment. When they're symptomatic, women tend to go to the, tend to also avoid going to the doctor and tend to go to the doctor at about the same rate as men. But it's in the case of prevention and regular sort of treatment, regular sort of uh, preventive screenings and preventive sort of maintenance and just going to the doctor well visits that we actually see where there's difference between men and women is. But when they're symptomatic, men don't necessarily go to the, the doctor any less than women. I mean, if you think about whether it's a father or mother or something like that, women who are or mothers who have lots of responsibilities at home, they're going to prioritize those other roles in the same way that men would far more than whether or not they want to go to the doctor or going to go to the doctor for something that they feel like is manageable. And so we do need to take these kind of narratives into account and think about whether or not these things are true. The last part of why I want to show this particular slide, and I'm sorry it's so complex, is that one of the things that we're seeing is that it's important to recognize that some of the things that we do that are protective of our mental health are actually harmful to our physical health. So there's a practical reason that people are choosing to do things like smoking, drinking, or whatever your coping behavior is of choice. It's worked for you in the past, so you're gonna to choose to do it again. So if your favorite you know, stress management strategy is to eat cake, and you, work, you figured out that it worked for you one time, you're probably gonna try it again, and then again. And if you do that once in a while, that's not a big deal. If you do that on a regular basis, it's going to actually do the, the thing that you're trying to do, which is protect your mental health and reduce the experience of stress, reduce the symptoms of depression that you may actually have, but actually it's going to, of course, then increase your physical risk in terms of things like chronic disease, cancer, diabetes, and actually brain health, poor, poor brain health as well. So we have to sort of take into account that these things are functional and not just sort of, and not just sort of dismiss them as though they're just choices that people are making that are bad. They're making choices that are actually logical in the context of their lives and in the context of the resources that they have in their environment. You can't cope with something you don't have access to, which is why the environment part is over here on this left side of the, of the screen, is because it's important for you to recognize that people, what's in their environment shapes what you have access to and what you can use to cope with stress. And stress is a huge part of what's determining how you're gonna cope, what you're gonna cope, and the kinds of differences that we see by race and other factors in the context of men's health and other uh, racial and ethnic disparities as well. So I think that's it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Griffith. Um, I think that was very eye-opening when you talked about how depression manifests um, differently for women. 
than men. Um, it may come out through aggression or substance abuse or risk-taking behavior. Um, is there any um, information or a source of information um, that you can advise or uh, give us a strategy for our, our, our women on the phone or who are watching, um, when we see these things manifest uh, for our spouse or our loved ones, our, you know, our brother, our sister, what, how do we address that? Well, I think it's, it's with care and understanding. I mean, I think it's recognizing that there may be something going on um, that you kind of, you know, there's often the carrot and the stick that we've used some, you know, the analogy from dealing with horses that you can motivate them through trying to sort of, usually we go to men with using negative things and we usually attack men, which is kind of what that initial ad was, is we sort of attack men's masculinity, we attack them or criticize them and think that you're going to motivate them by this negative sort of reaction, as opposed to potentially sometimes it could actually be encouragement or having some conversation or opening the conversation. Now, no, you can't expect, um, that the conversation is gonna go and be as free flowing as potentially sometimes it may be with girlfriends or with other women in your lives. No, it's not probably gonna be as long. No, it's probably not gonna be as deep and insightful, but it is the way that he's going to express himself. There is this thing called alexithymia that men don't have necessarily the language for being able to express themselves and being able to um, identify um, motions at the same way that women do simply because we don't have the same experience and practice at doing it that we that women do from a very young age. And so all these factors that can sort of play out, I think it's just a matter of recognizing what could be at play and to have those conversations, ask those questions and to be attentive. Uh, women often recognize things in men's health and men's lives that men don't recognize themselves. So it could be that he's not deciding to ignore something it could be that he's actually, you know, struggling with something that he doesn't necessarily recognize is problematic. And so we've done focus groups and interviews and qualitative work where we've asked men about things. And it's not until we've brought it to their attention that they actually recognize that this was an issue or that they were even doing what it was that we were describing. And so you have to kind of do things that at least, pay, you know, bring things to their attention and not assume that they're doing it intentionally but actually just you know, see if that's actually possible and then explore the conversation from there. Now, not to say that there's always need for the carrot, sometimes you do need to stick too. So I'm not suggesting that we always need to handle them with the kid gloves, but I do understand, I do want to at least put on the table that sometimes going immediately to the stick is not gonna be as productive as trying to engage them in a way that may be more sensitive and supportive. Wow such sage advice. Thank you so much. We are a little over our time. I thank you for the 190 plus people who are hanging in there with us. Uh, Dr. Griffith, if there are any additional questions in the chat, if you're available to respond to them. Uh, next up, we are going to close out with Dr. Joe Nasera. He is talking about uh, matters of the heart and brain, exercise and health. Dr. Nocera. All right, thank you. And uh, let me give you control. Okay, well, I'll, you. I'll advance and then you can <laughs> okay. go ahead. Thank you. So let me just start by, I wanna thank Dr. Parker and the, the organizers of the event for this invitation. Um, also to the other panelists for their very important and extremely relevant presentations. And then of course, all, all the attendees. So I'm gonna focus on an area that I think blends really uh, nicely with, with the previous talks uh, because it can beneficially impact many of the outcomes that we've uh, discussed today. And that is physical activity and exercise. I'll also talk about the other side of the coin. So um, the, the, in terms of, of poor health outcomes, a sedentary lifestyle. So how, how bad a sedentary lifestyle can be for you. And then I'll finish up the, describing some current recommendations for exercise uh, and give you all some examples of some exercise programs that you may be hopefully are interested in. So, you know, we all know that exercise is good for us, uh, but I like to remind everyone just how 
uh, beneficial exercise can't be. It can be. So if you look at uh, these numbers, uh, they're, they're pretty staggering. So uh, physical activity can reduce risk of heart disease by 40%, uh, lower risk of stroke by 27%, incidence of diabetes by 50%, high blood pressure by 50%, reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease by one third. And then when we talk about something like depression, it can be as, as effective as, as some drug therapies. Um, so, you know, that's, that, those are exciting and, and pre pretty robust, powerful numbers. And I do want to point out that the amount of exercise to benefit health and stamina and, and these outcomes that I'm talking about is lower than the amount that you would think about for uh, what people commonly think about for fitness. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that um, you can beneficially impact your health without changing, for example, physical appearance. And, and a lot of times, that's what people look for when they begin an intervention, um, is, is how's their physique changing? Well, we can benefit uh, many aspects of health without targeting a change in physique, for, for, for example. And really the key is to get up and move more. So we wanna avoid, again, a, a inactiv inactivity and a sedentary lifestyle. There we go. Uh, so, you know, just how bad is a, is a sedentary lifestyle and activity? Well, it's, it's really, really bad. Uh, so this table lists risk factors for negative health outcomes. And you can see that the number one uh, negative health outcome listed in terms of a risk factor is, is smoking. And so we all know that smoking is very, very bad for you. And, and a higher number there on the right side is, is a higher risk. And so smoking is the highest. Uh, next below that is physical inactivity. And right below that is a BMI of over 30, which would put you at obese. So the idea of physical activity being um, extremely bad for you is, is kind of exemplified nicely in this. And again, that, that higher number indicates greater risk on negative health outcomes and, and physical inactivity, sedentary lifestyle sits right behind smoking. And so if we were to quantify that with a number, we know that a quarter million, 250,000 premature deaths in the United States every year are directly attributed to physical activities. So it's pretty staggering. And then it's also important to point out that for many of these uh, risk factors listed, listed, exercise would actually be one of the main uh, treatments for them. So now, I, you know, there's a, there's a question that I, that I get from people pretty often, and it's about risk factors associated with exercise. So, so I have condition X uh, and I'm not sure if exercise is safe for me. Now we've highlighted how uh, bad not exercising is for you. So it's, and it's certainly more, um, more times uh, the benefits outweigh the, the risk, but obviously if, if you're concerned, it would be, it would be important to consult with you, with your doctor. Uh, but there has been research that has, exactly looked into this um, in terms of the safety of exercise. And I briefly summarize here. So it's, there's consistent findings that, that aerobic and other types of exercise among patients with different diseases does not have um, negative effects on disease progression. There's accumulating evidence that patients with chronic exercise, uh, chronic disease exercise therapy can, can improve their, um, their disease profile and in some cases delay mortality. And then severe complications during exercise are, are pretty, pretty rare. Um, so, you know, again, just for those that tend to be a little concerned, oh, is exercise going to be worse? Again, the benefits typically outweigh the risk, uh, but again, it's not a bad idea to consult with a, a physician. So, you know, now the, the next question that I get uh, quite often is, is, well, what exercise is best for me? Uh, am I doing the, the right exercise? And really, the, the answer to that is quite simple. Um, it has to be something that you enjoy. That way, you'll continue to do it. It's got to be something that you, you really, um, you know, you're not, you're not miserable doing. For example, you, you hear people oftentimes just, I can't stand being, going to the gym and, and walking on the treadmill. And that's, that's not what you want to target. You want to target something that you can enjoy uh, for at least most of the time that you're doing it. So when we get tired and fatigued, that changes a little bit, but it's got to be something that you enjoy. And obviously it can be a variety of things. Uh, so, you know, there's the, the, the examples are, are vast. So walking inside of a mall, for example, uh, walking outside of a park, swimming, hiking, uh, biking, outside or inside on a stationary bike, um, 
So those are just a few. There's also T, you know, uh, where you can engage with people, racquetball, for example. Uh, so again, there, there, those are just a few examples, but uh, it's got to be something that you enjoy. And oftentimes we've found that group-based exercise, um, so hiking with, with other, other um, friends, family, uh, kind of provides that support system that helps people go out and, and do it more, which is, which is really important. But the point is, just make it something that you enjoy. So, you know, the next, uh, the next thing that a lot, of, a lot of individuals ask is, well, how much exercise, if I'm, maybe I'm doing the right exercise, but how much do I actually need to do? And, and the nice thing is there are very specific guidelines, and these come from the American Heart Association, for example, um, and the American College of Sports Medicine. And what they recommend is 150 minutes um, each week, so every week, of moderate intense aerobic physical activity, uh, moderate intensity or aerobic physical activity. So that would be kind of a brisk walk. You should still be able to hold a conversation, uh, but you should definitely feel your breathing uh, being a little bit impacted. Uh, water aerobics could be another example of that, depending on how hard you, you push yourself. Um, or, so not both, or you could do 75 minutes per week of, of more vigorous activity. So this would be uh, to a level where your breathing is, is impacted, where you're having more difficulty holding a conversation with somebody. Uh, an example of this could be, could be jogging, uh, swimming, uh, is, swimming laps is certainly an example of that. And so in terms of how much do you, do you need to do at uh, one time, you obviously, most people don't want to have, want to or have the time to do 150 minutes straight. So you break that up across days and the, the target should be that you at least do 10 minutes at a time. So if you decide uh, swimming or hiking, or you want to do at least 10 minutes at a time. Um, so some other, other recommendations in addition to one of those two is that you do moderate to high intensity muscle strengthening exercises. So the reason for this is that as individuals age, uh, your muscles begin to atrophy or shrink, and we want to try to avoid that as much as possible. So moderate to high intensity muscle strengthening exercises uh, two or more times on, on the major muscle groups. So this would be your upper extremity, for example, arm, chest, and then also your legs, uh, for example. You want to do the target those two times per week. Uh, and then the, the last thing, because uh, falls risk tends to go up uh, pretty high as people age, it's also recommended that there's exercise uh, to maintain or improve balance. And really the nice thing is that many of the exercises that you uh, might be interested in or might choose to do also targets balance. So you wouldn't have to necessarily do a specific balance exercise if you were doing um, wall squats, for example, for, to strengthen your legs, that actually helps balance. Or there's uh, maybe if you chose Tai Chi exercise, uh, that's certainly something that could impact balance. So just to get to uh, the last slide here, I wanted to provide some evidence base. So these are, are types of exercises that have been studied extensively and, and uh, my team has studied quite a bit of these. So on the aerobic exercise side of things, we've done a lot of work with, with spin cycling. So that's, that's stationary cycling. Um, and, and we've looked at brain health outcomes. We've looked at physical out outcomes. And, and that's certainly some benefits to that. Uh, that would also target your lower extremity strength, so your leg strength, which so you'd be kind of checking two boxes there. Uh, again, walking and jogging is pretty common. Uh, for strength training, I included a, a link for Ageless Grace. So this is, uh, provides a lot of examples of exercises that you could do in the home. Uh, that's particularly important right now. Uh, so there's a, a link there that may help. And then there's also um, uh, for balance exercises and range of motion, as well as strength exercises, there's uh, the National Institute of Aging created what's called Go For Life. And I, I have a link there for that. Um, really good resources. Uh, that, that can help. And then another example on the flexibility or range of motion side, yoga has always been uh, really beneficial from that standpoint. So hopefully those uh, can benefit you. And obviously, if you have any uh, follow-up questions, uh, I can, we can take them now, but I'm always uh, available through, through email and uh, uh, always, always uh, open to uh, answer any questions you might have. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Dr. Nocera. Um, can you just reiterate, is, is it 150 minutes over the course of seven days? And it, what I interpreted is that is a combination of the strength training with aerobic, or is it one or the other, or, or what is it? 
Yeah, so if it'll let me go back. Yeah, so if you choose the kind of the more moderate, uh, lower level intense exercise, you're going to want to try to do about two and a half hours over the course of a seven day week. Um, so you, you could break that up into, into 30 minute sessions, obviously, you do more days. But over the course of a week at, at a moderate intense level, so for example, if you were going out walking uh, and you were going to walk for 30 minutes each time, you'd want to stagger that over the course of seven days such that you achieve uh, two and a half hours over the course of that seven days. If you were going to do something a little more vigorous, again, something that, that might um, kind of take your breath away a little bit more, a higher intensity exercise, you could cut that in half uh, to 75 minutes a week. And I, I should also, you know, point out that, that there's, you know, more um, really clear ways to measure this, for example, rather than just kind of gauging your breathing, um, you know, with technology and, and watches and things like that, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can measure heart rate. Um, you could even do it manually if you want, but that's a, a very um, objective measure of how hard you're working. And so you could base it on heart rate as well. But yeah, the time is, is over a seven day week. Okay, perfect. And one closing question is, what about if I've had a hip replacement? What can I do? What type of exercises? Yeah, so that's going to de depend uh, quite a bit on, on when and how long ago the, the hip replacement was. Um, you, you may be, if it's early on, you probably um, engage in some type of type, uh, sorry, physical therapy. Uh, but as you progress through that and as you get cleared to do more activities, um, again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be focused on something that you enjoy, uh, but there may be a time where you, early on, where it's going to be less weight bearing, right? So an example of that would be swimming, uh, water aerobics, uh, stationary bicycling. And again, as you progress through, uh, you, you'll probably want to incorporate more weight-bearing exercises, begin to start uh, targeting lower extremity strength. Um, but it really does, does uh, depend on when uh, the, the um, surgery was done. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so thank you all again for joining us. Um, we appreciate you for coming and uh, being here with us on this Wednesday. We've addressed a lot today. Um, Dr. Parker, if you want to have any closing uh, remarks or observations, we will be back next Wednesday and uh, we are addressing, we will have presentations from Dr. Hajar, Dr. Parker, and Dr. Sperling, who will be addressing brain health, physi physiological and psychological stress on the brain, as well as uh, cardiovascular interventions. Well, thank you, Cornelia. Thank all of you to those of you who registered for our presentation. Um, we will, I think Cornelia has let you know that these presentations are gonna be on our Emory Alzheimer's Disease Research Center website, and you can kind of hit the tab and kind of follow up with what we've said. Um, we do have research that will be available as soon as the state and um, powers that be, if you will, make it possible for us to meet with people in person and in a face-to-face -face method. Um, and as soon as that comes up about, you'll be able to find that on our website as well. Please tune in next week, uh, next Wednesday, and the following Wednesday for our uh, special seminar for men. Each Tuesday, um, we have um, other topics that have to do with brain health. And keep in mind, you know, we are going through a real rough time right now in our country, in our society, and we wanna keep in touch with you. We wanna know what you wanna know about. And when we can meet with you, we want you to enroll in our ongoing research studies. The Emory Healthy Brain Study is something you can do online, and that's a way to participate in research. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.